First, I want to welcome you on behalf of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, my name is John Cusey. I manage government relations at AEI. We have Luke Strange who also, and Emily uh, Rapp, who is also here in the back, who are part of the government relations team. Uh, so let us know if you have questions afterwards, uh, in addition to questions you might have for the speakers. But welcome. Um, Peter Wallison is the Arthur F. Burns Fellow in Finan uh, Financial Policy Studies at AEI. He joined AEI in 1999 after practicing law, specializing in financial regulation for 33 years. In his government service, he was counsel to <coughs> Vice President Nelson Rockefeller during the Ford administration and general counsel of the Treasury and White House counsel during the Reagan administration. <coughs> Peter. Thank you, John, and thank all of you for uh, coming to this, I think it's going to be a very interesting and informative um, afternoon. Um, <clears throat> under the Dodd-Frank Act, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which I will call, and everyone else calls, FSOC, uh, which consists principally of the heads of the federal financial regulators, is authorized to designate certain non-bank financial institutions uh, as what are called systemically important financial institutions, and I'll use the term SIFIs for that, and I think most of the other people who will be up here will be doing that too. All banks with more than $50 billion in assets were designated under the Dodd-Frank Act as SIFIs automatically. Uh, but a firm can be designated as a SIFI if, this is by the FSOC, if in the judgment of the FSOC, Financial distress, and these, the, these are the statutory terms, financial distress at such a firm could cause instability in the United States financial system. So both of those terms are very important for statutory purposes, and they have very little meaning <coughs> on their own. The firms so designated are then turned over to the Fed for what looks to be uh, prudential and bank-like regulation but they still must comply with the rules of the industry they are in, um, whether it's capital markets or whether it's insurance or any other industry that is otherwise regulated. I doubt that many of you have had a chance to read the decision of the FSOC when it designated Prudential as a SIFI a few weeks ago. If you read it, you would have found that it contains no standards for judgment and no useful information about why Prudential is a SIFI or why it has to be regulated by the Fed. There's an old expression in law enforcement that a prosecuting attorney could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. Well, it, make, it seems clear to me after reading the Prudential decision that the FSOC has the power to designate a ham sandwich as a SIFI. This is an extraordinary amount of power and if not used wisely, it could have a very adverse uh, effect on the U.S. economy. Thus far, the FSOC has designated three non-bank financial institutions, uh, AIG, GE Capital, and Prudential. It is also investigating MetLife right now for possible designation. Recently, BlackRock and Fidelity, two large asset managers, were told that they are being investigated for SIFI designation also, raising the possibility that major firms in the capital markets could also now be included among the SIFIs. The capital markets are far and away the largest source of financing for U.S. business and much more important funding sources than the banks. If you look at that chart, it's a little hard to see, but all of you have handouts with that chart in it. But you can see that the gap between what banks are supplying to U.S. business and what the capital markets are supplying to U.S. business is widening over time. It started, it's, they started diverging in the 1980s and it's just continuing to, to widen. Now, that, the reason for that, I think in part, is that the capital markets are just simply more efficient in providing these funds than are banks. And we'll get to, we'll get to that um, in detail a little bit later. Designating securities and capital markets firms as, as SIFIs could have major consequences for credit availability, credit cost, and thus for economic growth. We have scheduled this lunch and meeting today to alert the staff on the Hill to the changes in the financial system that can be effected by SIFI designations. 
We will begin with a keynote by Congressman Scott Garrett, who's the chairman of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets and GSEs of the House Financial Services Committee. After the Congressman's talk, Commissioner Gallagher, Paul Gallagher, uh, Dan Gallagher, and Paul Kupiek of AEI and I will provide some thoughts on aspects of the FSOC, uh, uh, what it is doing and what it may mean for the U.S. economy. So, Scott Garrett. Scott Garrett is in his sixth term as a member of Congress from New Jersey's 5th District. At the start of the 112th Congress, he was selected to serve <coughs> as chairman of the Subcommittee on Capital Markets and Government-Sponsored Enterprises after serving as the ranking member in the 111th Congress. In this role, Garrett provide, uh, presides over subcommittee uh, subcommittees with jurisdiction over the, a subcommittee with jurisdiction <coughs> over equity, fixed income and derivatives markets, investment advisors and broker dealers, the secondary mortgage market, the accounting and auditing profession, and the investment fund industry. Prior to his election to Congress, Garrett served in the New Jersey General Assembly as chairman of the Banking and Insurance Committee. Congressman Garrett. I appreciate that first person who starts the applause. So, um, so I'm just going to move this over here. Wherever this is your, that's, it, that's okay. So I appreciate the uh, kind introduction. Appreciate the chance to uh, speak for uh, a few minutes. Um, keynote. I, uh, you know, it always sounds so much more important than it is when it's a key, key up, keynote. When all of you could, uh, you know, run rings around me on on the topics that uh, we're talking about. But I do appreciate the. Uh, Invitation, appreciate the uh, pack room, appreciate the uh, meal, even though I did not get any, but we'll address the timing of this later. Uh, I appreciate that um, Dan is, uh, Commissioner, is here today as well. Um, Commissioner has been doing a um, tremendous job over at the SEC. Um, he's been doing a really good job in a bunch of things, but in essence, what I want to talk about for a second is in highlighting the, the important topics that we're talking today and the concerns of implementation of Dodd-Frank and try and also to bring back some, I would say, some common sense to the uh, regulatory process as well. Also, Paul, it's a pleasure to uh, see you and meet, meet you. Um, did read your recent piece in, uh, on, on, on banking agency staff pay, and uh, I do recommend it to all of the congressional, how many people here are congressional staff, by the way, that's in the room? Okay, so I recommend his piece. If you haven't already see, seen it, take a look at that. Um, to the members of congressional staff, if you want to someday leave your congressional staff position and make absurdly high pay, do not become a lobbyist. I won't ask for the, all the lobbyists in the room to raise their hand, um, but instead be a banking regulator. Um, that's where the money apparently is. I'm hoping, uh, well not hoping, but anticipating that uh, you know our governor from New Jersey, Chris Christie, may potentially run for president, and if he does, um, then I guess there's a possibility that um, I could ask him to be, get an appointment to the Board of Governors over at the Federal Reserve. Um, I would not have to leave here to become a lobbyist. I could just get an amazingly, embarrassingly large pay over there. I say embarrassing because they will not even obviously release um, the pay that the <laughs> folks over at the Federal Reserve get. Anyway, so what we're talking about today, a specific topic uh, for today's luncheon is issues and concerns surrounding EPSOC. And when you asked me to come over and do this, I asked Chris on our staff, how long have you reserved the room for? Because if you really wanted to talk about everything on, that's on this plate, it would take up the entire day. But I'll try to just bring this down to a short period and go to the panel. Um, I would start by bringing it all down briefly to re-examining the original rationale behind the creation of EPSOC. So the U.S. financial regulatory system is basically a myriad of different independent regulatory bodies that have evolved, but you can sort of say almost organically, um, over the uh, beginning of the 20th century. And these regulatory agencies police various different financial market participants and their activities, with many what you might say is overlapping and also competing responsibilities as well. And so the argument that was made by the proponents of Dodd-Frank was this that while each of these agencies have their own specific area of expertise, right, um, there was no one single formal body that was designed to take a holistic or broader look at the potential issues facing all of the financial markets. 
So that was good. So the original concept behind formalizing such a body was basically to help facilitate a discussion, if you will, and a communication between well, all these groups' members. And so the initial hope there was that this would be have better communications and would allow the regulators then to do what? Basically to look out across the horizon and to spot potential problems before they became problems and do so um, more quickly and hopefully to mitigate them. Now just stepping aside from my notes here, going back to my original comments, it, the absurdity of that in one sense is, is that they were paying these regulators astronomical salaries and sometimes salaries that we don't know anyway and you would sort of think that it isn't it incumbent upon a regulator who's making these salaries, who are already experts in the field, to actually spend some of their time talking to each other? And did it really require an act of Congress to say maybe they should actually get together on, on a regular basis? But apparently not. And so that's why the rationale we have for Dodd-Frank is to force them to do that. And so it's good in theory, but that's not exactly what we wound up with. As the Dodd-Frank process, um, continues forward, the scope and reach of this new entity began to increase and increase <coughs> significantly. And finally, you have FSOC. And FSOC was created with the voting members being the heads of who? The, each of the independent financial regulatory agency, and you have the uh, Secretary Liu or the Secretary of Treasury, and also um, an independent insurance representative all thrown onto the FSOC board. Now this um, board, or this council or, you know, grand poobahs, if you will, of the, all the a agencies come together, they have what? They have an authority to designate nearly any bank and any non-bank financial company activity or their practices as a systemic threat to the U.S. financial system, and then do what else? To subject them to additional prudential regulations by who? By the Federal Reserve. So if you look at that, the FSOC's actual functional authority is you might say somewhat limited. It only has the authorities to do those two things, to A, designate SIPIs in the first place, and then the authority to recommend those additional regulations, but of course you can begin to anticipate what those additional regulations is pretty broad. So the consequences of being designated are potentially tremendous, and they could have extremely negative impact for everyone in this room, for U.S. taxpayers payers, and also for all of us as far as the broader economy is concerned as well. And on top of this, besides those specific authorities that are in statute, obviously they also have a very large bully pulpit, if you will, that they can use to influence, to threaten, to cajole other financial institutions, other regulators, and the markets as a whole. And so as the FSOC begins to aggressively, as it has, assert itself over our financial markets, a number of problems with the structure and operating practices have come to light. I think we need to take a look at the, the FSOC and make sure that this council will really uh, be an asset, as it intended, and that the free markets will be able to continue on after it. Now, in looking at this audience, I see there's a lot of people here who are a lot younger than me. Um, so for the younger ones, you may not remember this TV show called the $25,000 Pyramid. How many people remember when it was the $25,000? Yeah, see, no one anymore. I'm getting so old. Back then, you know, when it came on, $25,000 really was a lot of money. Um, but the way the game works was this, that uh, you go through the game and then you, you get to the final round and the final round is called the winner circle and as you go through the game you get progressively har harder and harder questions. Now I'm not, I'm not any Dick Clark, how many people remember who Dick Clark is? There's another <laughs> oh my gosh, I gotta update this I guess. Um, I, I thought what we're gonna do here is to organize some of these questions uh, as on FSOC in a progressive manner, um, a little harder and harder and harder as we go along. There is no prize at the end, however. Um, except maybe get rid of FSOC. Anyway, so F question number one. Should the FSOC be subject to the same transparency and accountability standards that we demand from other parts of the government? And that's a ding. The short answer is yes, of course. It's hard to believe that we have to ask such a question as this. Can you just do the ding for me at least? <laughs> yeah. um, but obviously we want them to be as transparent parent as all the other agencies, but we know that right now that FSOC is a black box, if you will. Some of you, maybe many of you know that I tried to recently attend an FSOC meeting to carry out my constitutional authorities as a member of Congress and oversight, and the Treasury Department told me no. Um, so when independent financial regulators meet to formalize <coughs> new rules and new proposals, these meetings are almost always open to the public and to members of Congress. And so you have to ask yourself, why is FSOC um, different? 
Um, if members of Congress can be trusted to examine sensitive national security information, I believe that we can be probably treated to sit down on a meeting of financial uh, regulators discussing their balance sheets of a member of a publicly traded corporation. Matter of fact, when I leave here, I believe at 1.30, um, I will be going over to the Capitol to look at the uh, top secret documents. So they trust me with that. They apparently do not trust me with um, information that's being held over at FSOC. In addition to the EPSOC's unwillingness to allow members of Congress and other non-principal financial regulators to attend their meetings, the EPSOC is not subject to two other good government statutes that we have. One is the Government in Sunshine Act, and the other is the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Also, the EPSOC does not release any substantive transcripts other than their closed meetings. They release simply a printout of attendees and a high-level <laughs> generic paragraph about what they discussed. So, well, in mind, tomorrow, FSOC is planning to hold a meeting to adopt some additional transparency measures. That's better late than never, I guess. However, we spoke to some informed people who, about this who shared with us that those additional provisions really are just going to be, if you will, window dressing, an attempt by the regulatory community now after the fact to um, make up for the fact that they didn't do before. So we'll see what comes with that. Question two. Should the FSOC be structured in a way that increases White House political control over financial regulation? Bing, the answer is no, good, no, exactly. They shouldn't be able to do that, come on. Uh, currently, all 10 members of the voting members of FSOC are President Obama's political appointees, and most are registered Democrats. I won't do a show of hands here, um, with a few being independents. Um, this structure ensures that instead of being an unbiased and data-driven <coughs> forum for, to identify and address political risk to the system, the FSOCs will continue to be a partisan body run by um, professional politicians. You know, for agencies with multi-member uh, bipartisan boards such as the SEC, for example, only the chair can attend these FSOC meetings um, and vote. Both the Republican and Democrat SEC uh, commissioners have voiced their concerns for not being able to attend these FSOC meetings. You know, Congress set up these agencies with multi-member boards for a reason, to provide a variety of views and perspectives. Yet on FSOC, only the chair can vote. And for some reason, however, the Federal Reserve is allowed to have several members of their board, some reason, in attendance in addition to Chair Yellen. And why is that? It seems inappropriate. Any group comp comprised completely of people with simmer, similar phil philosophical beliefs is prone to falling into what is called groupthink, especially here in Washington. And in fact, if all the votes so far, the FSOC appears to be returning into a collection of all yes men for the desired outcome of the Treasury, the White House, and the Federal Reserve. Another significant concern with the structure is placed under the leadership of the Treasury Department and the Treasury. As chairman, of the Treasury Secretary calls the meetings. He also gets to set the agenda. What does this do? This gives the White House even more sway over the supposedly independent financial regulator. See, the original intent, as I said, behind the creation of independent financial regulators was what? To set up bodies that would have their additional expertise to implement the technical policies that we propose in Congress. And so these agencies were to be independent of control by the executive and not independent of congressional oversight. Now, however, with the Treasury as head of EPSOC, the White House enjoys greater control over the independent financial regulators than ever, which is leading to an increasing politicalization of the bodies. And it's important to remember that the President comes and goes, and someday there will be a Republican back in the White House. And although I might be finding it to have an old GOP EPSOC, more agreeable than what we have right now, it would still be an inappropriate way for us to regulate our financial system. And so we need a system that reduces the pressure to make political decisions in this regulatory process. Question three, should the Foreign um, Financial Stability Board, that's FSB, the U.S. Department of Treasury, and the Federal uh, Reserve designate U.S. companies as globally systemically important financial in institutions, so those are GCBs, before the domestic process goes through the FSOC? Should they do it internationally before they do it nationally? And the right answer is no. Hey, there you're catching on, sort of. Currently, there are two places where U.S. companies can be deemed systemically important. One is in the U.S. through FSOC, and the second is globally through FSB. So the FSB, what is that? That is a non-incorporated Swiss association. It has no legal authority whatsoever here in the United States. However, the FSB has already designated a number of insurance companies as uh, GCPs. And one of the insurance companies already designated by FSB as, a, um, as such is MetLife. 
Uh, the problem is, in the US, the FSOC is the only entity that any, has any legal authority to do so do that. And FSOC has not yet designated uh, MetLife as a SIPI. So how do the international organizations where the Treasury and the Fed are members designate uh, MetLife before FSOC did? And what does that really mean for um, MetLife? All good questions. So let's go back real quick. Back on July 18th of last year, F uh, FSB, a formal decision, um, released saying that MetLife is, is a um, global SIPI. It says the FSB, in consultation, this is important, with the International Association of Insurance Supervisors and no national authorities have identified an initial list of nine uh, G SIPIs. So who are, you might be asking, those national authorities that they referenced? Well, when this national authority was consulted, um, what did they say? I would assume one would be Treasury, the other would be the Federal Reserve um, or the uh, SEC, since they're responsible entities in the US with regard to FSB. And I doubt that the uh, SS SEC uh, weighed in on this. So we looked into it and we learned through several discussions with FSB that they have a practice, sort of a gentleman's agreement, if you will, between all of their members over there. And when it comes to a potential designation of a company, the home country, in this case the US, through their national authority that I referred to before, has the power to veto the decision. Now that's important. This means while the FSOC is going through its designation process over here in the US, either the Treasury or the Federal Reserve gave their tacit endorsement and approval, if you will, to the FSB to include MetLife as a GCP without any formal votes having been taken by FSOC here in the US. So you have to ask yourself, why is either the Treasury or the Fed abrogating the FSOC's sovereign authority to determine whether a US company is systemically important? Um, does anyone sincerely believe that now that MetLife has been designated globally, um, that FSOC will now not make them a SIPI here in the US? So this process, obviously, as it's laid out to you, is a going concern. The FSB is in the middle of a review of 14 US asset managers for potential designation as non-bank um, non-insurance, that's NBNI GCPs. Um, so that's all going on, so that's why it's important. It's done, already done with uh, MetLife, they're looking at 14 other asset managers. So all of this, there's been a complete lack of ability for anyone to make a coherent argument on how asset managers can be systemically risky given their agency nature of investing and complete lack of coverage. <coughs> However, the shadow regulator serving as the national authority that I referred to before, FSB, for asset managers gives the green light over here then FSB could quickly move ahead with the designation for all 14. And what does that mean? This could have significant impact on the FSOC process, which is also currently reviewing the asset management industry. Unfortunately, FSOC's review of the industry so far, they have not been listening very closely to the asset management primary regulator, the SEC, and this leads me to the fourth question. Should the regulator, with the greatest expertise of a certain type of business, market, or activity by the regulator of the business, market, or activity, should they be the one involved? This seems like an easy question. Hey, there we go. <laughs> of course, the agency that has the greatest expertise and knowledge of a certain firm, market, or activity should be the primary regulator. That is why, for instance, Congress created the independent expert agencies like the SEC. Unfortunately, in our overly complex post dodd frank world, the answer to the question, unfortunately, is not clear. And I'll let Commissioner Gallagher expand on this topic when he talks a little um, in discussion, however. But when a non-bank financial entity, say an insurance company or an asset manager, is designated a systemically important, the next step is not tailored regulation by that firm's primary regulator to the extent is needed. I mean, that would be too logical. Instead, Dodd-Frank compounded the problem of SIFI designation by allowing designated firms to be subjected to enhanced regulation by who? The Federal Reserve. Why is that? It certainly can't be because the Fed is the agency that has developed over many years the experience and the specific knowledge and expertise necessarily to oversee them. For insurance companies and asset managers, that would be state insurance uh, regulators. They're the experts in the SEC, respectively. And it also can't be because the Fed's unique mandate is better suited to overseeing and regulating these firms in which they participate. In the securities market, for example, the Fed's safety and soundness, or what we call the no-risk mandate, really doesn't apply, it doesn't fit. Why not? Well, because investors in the securities market can only make a return to the extent that an investor is willing to assume risk on their money or companies 
um, if they want to succeed. So the more likely answer to all this is the apparent desire by the Fed and many other to de-risk the entire financial market and place it under a government safety net so wide and thick that no firm and no market um, can ever fail again. So next, the obvious question has a negative impact on investment, growth, and innovation. Um, question five, should the FSOC provide clear criteria to U.S. companies regarding the parameters used to determine how and why a designation is made and what steps a company can um, take to avoid designation? And the answer is yes. So you go like this, you know what the answer is if you're not following. It's important to remember that the reasons that the U.S. has the deepest and most liquid capital markets is because of our commitment to the rule of law. Um, so the FSOC's ambiguous uh, will know it when we see it approach provides no um, appropriate legal clarity to the investors or creditors that are considering investing. As the FSOC currently operates, there are absolutely no clear rules or criteria in order to determine when a non-bank financial institution qualifies as systemic risk. And this is to say nothing of the fact that there's no coherent, universally accepted definition of what a systemic risk is at all, still today. Um, so one of the biggest problems right now with the designation process is the lack of an empirical confines of post <coughs> pre and post designation. We met in our office um, a few weeks ago with Roy Woodall. He is the independent insurance expert on FSOC and one of the few, what we would say is non-yes men um, with regard to FSOC. He gave a blistering dissent when FSOC designated the insurance company Prudential. Let me just read one paragraph, quote, he said, Key aspects of said analysis are not supported by the record or actual experience and therefore are not persuasive. The underlying analysis utilizes scenarios that are antithetical to a fundamental and seasonal, unseasoned understanding of the business of insurance, the insurance regulatory environment, and the state insurance resolution and guarantee fund system. As presented, therefore, the analysis makes it impossible for me to concur because the grounds for the top final determination are simply not reasonable or defensible and provide no basis for me to concur. Pretty strong. So the formal designation by FSOC and Mr. Woodall's dissent makes this painfully clear that FSOC is only willing to use arbitrary and exaggerated hypotheticals to make its case rather than be um, data driven. And not only has FSOC failed to make it clear than convincing case using any empirical information that's in initial non-bank designations are appropriate, they also provide no guidance to companies about what changes they can make to that business model to avoid being um, appropriately um, out of the system. Let's move on to question number six. Should the FSOC have the ability to designate non-banks as systemically important institutions? No, good, thank you, sorry. So I told you that earlier that $25,000 um, was gonna be the qu hardest question, or after that I have just described many of these seem the easier questions. But to truly answer this question effectively, we must determine what exactly the SIPI designation means from a market perspective. So I talk to the people, the stakeholders in the market regularly. They almost unanimously tell me that when a company is designated as a SIPI, it is equivalent to the company being designated as too big to fail. So that means basically that a SIFI equals a TBTF, if you're following with us here. So when I thought about this perspective, it should give you a considerable pause that the current approach is the proper one. This understanding should also help highlight the magnitude of making these designations and reinforce the notion that the previous questions discussed today should also be addressed before continuing on down the road that we're talking about. So finally, I realize that there are a number of very large, complex, and interconnected companies, and they do pose unique risks. But I do question whether having a formal designation that carries with it enormous consequences for all of us, U.S. taxpayers, and competition in the marketplace is the best way to address these challenges. Other ways to address these concerns regarding financial stability are to reestablish market discipline by more clearly defining who is in and who is out of the government safety net, as well as significantly limiting the Federal Reserve 13-3 emergency lending authority. So in the aftermath of one of the worst financial crises this country has ever seen, I do understand the desire by some in the regulatory community to extinguish all risk in the marketplace. But this approach carries real and significant side effects for economic growth and job creation. The financial regulatory communities continue to move forward with significant changes to the ways our system operates. These changes will alter how capital and credit flows worldwide. And so when we're making decisions that have led this level of impact, 
it is incumbent upon all of us, the policymakers and the regulators, to take a thorough and thoughtful approach. The FSOC must become more transparent, less political, more accountable, more informed, and more data driven. And Congress should fully re examine the FSOC structure, its process, its authority, in order to determine if this approach is really the approach that we want to use going forward. And with that, thank you very much for your kind attention. And no, no one won the $25,000 in this audience, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. It's not often that we have a keynote speaker that's just as comfortable on the expert panel as all of our experts. So uh, if we had an honorary AEI scholar title, I think we'd uh, give that to Chairman Garrett there. Um, so now we're going to go to our panel um, of uh, experts. And I already did introduce Peter Wallison, so I'm just going to hand it off to him now. Thanks again, John. That was really a very, very useful talk by Congressman Garrett. And he talked about something that no one had raised before, but I'm going to uh, spend some time on, and that is this Financial Stability Board. Um, I want to give you some more additional detail about it, because I really think this is very important to understand the relationship between the Financial Stability Board and the FSOC. Um, in 2008, shortly after the financial crisis, the G20 leaders, that is the presidents, and prime ministers of the 20 largest uh, countries in the world uh, directed the Financial Stability Board, which I'll be calling the FSB, um, to develop plans for preventing another financial crisis. So the FSB's authority, if you want to think about it this way, it comes right from so-called the top. Although it is true, it is not a government agency in any way, but it was given this kind of mandate to come up with ideas to prevent the next financial crisis. So it's a very important organization to keep in mind. The FSB, the FSB is a group of central banks and financial regulators from the 20 largest countries. The Treasury, the Fed, and the SEC are members. The, GS, the G20's direction gave the FSB a lot of power, just like the Dodd-Frank Act gave to the FSOC. In fact, the power is being used in exactly the same way. They have the power um, to, uh, they have empowered to declare certain institutions are, as Congressman Garrett suggested, um, systemically important financial institutions, or SIFIs, and they have been using it. They have no power to enforce the laws or the rules that they make, but they ex seem to expect that the countries that are members of the FSB will then pick up the baton and enforce those rules within their own jurisdictions. Since 2008, the FSB has been moving aggressively along the same lines that were authorized for the uh, FSOC. There are many indications that the FSOC is coordinating its actions with the FSB. When the, F when the FSB said that they thought if money market funds were um, going to continue to use stable net asset values, they should have something like capital. Well, the FSOC then picked up that idea and pressed the SEC to do that. When the FSB said that they thought that money market, m money managers of uh, $100 billion or more ought to be considered uh, for SIPI designation, we then found out that the FSOC had already ask the Office of Financial uh, Research, which is another Treasury agency, to give them a report on whether a, an asset manager could create systemic risk. So obviously there was some coordination there. And then finally, when the FSB designated nine large insurance companies, three of which were US companies, and that is Prudential, MetLife, and AIG, as SIFIs, well, the FSOC proceeded to designate both AIG and, uh, and uh, uh, Prudential, and is now investigating MetLife for exactly the same purpose. So what we have here is what looks like 
exactly what the pattern has been in the banking area. In the banking area, there, a committee called the Basel Committee on Bank Supervision uh, decides what the capital levels should be for banks and how to define that and so forth. And the regulators in all the countries that are members of the Basel Committee then are expected to follow out those rules in their respective jurisdictions. Congress has generally not interfered with this process, and it may be that the FSB expects that the FSOC will implement within the United States the SIFI designations that the FSP, FSB develops. And, and uh, Chairman Garrett was really very good at describing what is happening there and what is, what's peculiar about this, because the Fed and the Treasury uh, seem to have already designated MetLife as a SIFI before the FSOC has, con has completed its investigation in the United States. So you wonder how real this, act, this investigation is if MetLife has already be con been considered a global SIFI. So obviously, in the United States, it's going to be a SIFI. But there we are. Um, since the financial crisis, and this is where we get into the capital markets, which I think are extremely important. Since the financial crisis, many regulators, pundits, and academics have, ar have argued that something called, quote, shadow banking, and I'm going to use that term a lot, was responsible for the financial crisis and must be brought under firmer regulatory control. The term shadow banking was brilliantly conceived, I think, since it implies that something illicit or even sinister is going on. Um, until 2011, the FSB made no effort to try to define what shadow banking was, but in, at its 2011 meeting, according to the FSB, the G20 uh, agreed to strengthen the oversight of shadow banking. Uh, if you try to think about presidents and so forth <laughs> trying to decide what shadow banking is, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but in any event, at that point, the, the presidents and the prime ministers all focused on the idea that they wanted to take control of shadow banking. And they agreed to strengthen the oversight of shadow banking and directed the FSB to develop policies for review by the G20 at their meeting in 2012, which by 2012 the FSB had, of course, done. And it came up with a de this definition, and uh, I think it's right there. I, I'm sorry you can't see this from the back, but I will read it to you. Um, the FSB has come up with this definition. Shadow banking, it said, is the system of credit intermediation that involves entities and activities outside the regular banking system. In other words, shadow banking involves all credit intermediation, and that means basically transactions between lenders and borrowers, but all of that, of that activity, which is not subject to bank-like regulation. This definition, of course, is almost absurdly broad, especially since the financial world outside the banks um, and outside the bank-regulated system is many times larger than the banking system, especially in the United States. Before the 2012 statement, many observers had assumed that what the FSB had in mind when it was talking about credit intermediation um, that involved, it was something that involved what is called maturity transformation. Now, maturity transformation, which is turning short-term liabilities like deposits into long-term assets like mortgages, bank takes deposits, um, which are very short-term, of course, they can be withdrawn on demand, and uses that money to uh, buy or create mortgages. That's maturity transformation. You've tra transferred something from a short-term liability to a long-term asset. This is a risky activity, and it's a signature characteristic of banks. So you can see maybe this was what it was in their minds when they were thinking of shadow banks, that is, organizations that do the same thing, uh, but they do it outside the banking system. Investment banks, like Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch, got into trouble because they supported their long-term mortgages, their long-term assets, which were principally mortgages, with short-term loans, some of them overnight. So short-term liabilities, long-term assets. Could, you could say that's shadow banking. But I would, I would mention parenthetically that regular commercial banks got into the same trouble, about 500 million, 500 
500 of them failed, even though they were heavily regulated. So it wasn't just the investment banks that got into trouble. But if this was all, if maturity transformation was all that, that the FSB considered shadow banking, it would not be a threat to asset managers and others in the securities and capital markets business that do not engage in anything similar to maturity transformation. By 2012, however, the FSB had found reasons to include much more financial activity within the definition of maturity transformation and shadow banking. In a paper that it released in November 2012, the FSB stated, and we have it up there, the FSB statement right in the middle there, and I'll have to read it to you. It's, it's a little involved, but it's important to grasp what they are trying to get out here. Experience, experience from the financial crisis demonstrates the capacity of some non-bank entities and transactions to operate on a large scale in ways that create bank-like risks to financial stability, that is, long, this is in parens in their remark, long-term credit extension based on short-term funding and leverage, this is maturity transformation, right? Such risk creation may take place at an entity level, and here's the key point, but it can also form a part of a complex chain of transactions in which leverage and maturity transformation occur in stages and in ways that create multiple forms of feedback into the regulated banking system. So they've got a much more complex idea in mind here. Now, what did these words really mean? These were made clear by uh, former chairman Ben Bernanke, who has been a persistent advocate of regulating shadow banks, but he provided in a speech in 2012 a pretty good description of what the FSB was talking about here. And again, that's right over there, Ben Bernanke, 2012, if you can read it from where you're sitting. And I'll read it again um, in detail. I'm sorry that I have to read these long paragraphs, but it's the only way to make clear what they're doing. As an illustration, this is the quoting from um, Ben Bernanke, as an illustration, of shadow banking at work, consider how an automobile loan can be made and funded outside the banking system. The loan could be originated by a finance company that pools it with other loans in a securitization vehicle. Uh, uh, an investment bank might then sell tranches of the securitization to investors. The lower risk tranches could be purchased by an asset-backed commercial paper conduit. That's just a, a trust with a lot of um, uh, assets in it. In this case, he's talking about auto loans. That, in turn, funds itself by issuing commercial paper. That's a very short-term liability that is purchased by money market funds. So in this analysis, a number of different things work together so that a medium-term asset, which is an auto loan, is ultimately supported by short-term credit from money market funds. This is maturity transformation, which the FSB and Bernanke consider shadow banking. Using this reasoning process, in September of 2013, the FSB said that it is now reviewing, and quote here, reviewing how to extend the SIFI framework to global, systemically important, non-bank, non-insurance financial institutions. <coughs> This category of firms, said the FSB, includes securities broker dealers, finance companies, asset managers, and investment funds, including hedge funds. Thus, the theories have been developed that would provide a basis for designating many of the largest players in the securities and capital markets uh, as SIFIs. If, as has been true in the past, and I suggested this earlier, the F FSOC follows the FSB the way bank regulators follow the Basel Committee, it will mean that some of the largest firms in the securities and capital markets may be designated as SIFIs because they are considered shadow banks. My colleagues and I will describe why we believe this will be a serious problem for the U.S. economy, and by that I mean Dan and Paul. I'd like to begin with the chart that shows the growing gap between the banks and the securities or capital markets 
as the source of, finance, of financing business. And I mentioned this before because, again, you can see that this bank has, this, this gap has developed and is continuing to grow because it is more efficient to raise funds by selling bonds, notes, and commercial paper directly to investors instead of borrowing from a bank. One of the reasons for this is that banks are heavily regulated and thus have com many compliance costs to cover that securities and capital markets firms don't have. If securities and capital markets firms were regulated like banks, credit would be much more expensive and that means there would be less economic growth and fewer jobs. Commissioner Gallagher and Paul Kupiek will cover this in greater detail. But I want to address one specific issue. And again, Chairman Garrett talked about this. And this is the question of too big to fail. And I thought it was actually clever. It's CIFI equal TBTF. Um, maybe it's, it's the successor to E equal MC square, but it is, a, it is an important idea to keep in mind. Right now, TBTF is a huge problem in the banking industry. We all know about it. We've all read about it. With poorly thought out policies in the past, we have gotten ourselves into a place where we have a few giant banks and many small ones. We are concerned that the very biggest banks may be too big to fail, and, but we are afraid to break them up because we don't know what size would not be too big to fail. No one has any idea what that is. Meanwhile, many studies have shown that the largest banks get cheaper credit than their smaller competitors because creditors believe they won't be allowed to fail, so they're less risky. No other financial industry has this problem, including insurance and capital markets. We all assume that all firms in these industries can fail. As a result, Creditors have to watch them carefully, lest they lose their investment. It's important that we preserve this market discipline. Creditors are the only group, the only group, that gets no benefit from risk taking. A and so their concerns about risk are the source and support of market discipline. Designating a firm as a SIFI is a statement by the government that the firm is too big to fail. That's what it means when the FSOC says that the firm's financial distress, remember that, those terms from the beginning of my discussion, will cause, quote, instability in the U.S. financial system. If the FSOC proceeds with its designations, it will be introducing into other areas of the financial system the idea that certain firms are too big to fail and thus protected by the government. These other areas like securities and capital markets, have always assumed that anyone could fail. In fact, that is the way to weed out poorly managed firms. Because creditors are likely to see them as less risky, these government-protected firms, like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, with which you're all familiar, are likely to have costs of credit that are lower than that of their competitors. Over time, this will cause a consolidation of these industries with large firms driving out smaller ones because of the advantage of perceived government backing. Or it could work the other way. Perhaps the firms designated by the EFSA and regulated like banks uh, by the Fed have higher costs because of additional regulation. And many people have argued this. It would be a disadvantage to be a SIFI, and that explains why many people, many companies are trying to prevent being uh, designated as a SIFI. As I suggested earlier, that may be one of the reasons the capital markets are out, are out competing banks. This could mean that these large SIFI firms lose out in the competition with their more nimble and less regulated competitors, and we end up with a lot of failing firms that have been designated too big to fail. We don't know the answer. We do not know yet what effect uh, bank-like regulation of non-bank firms will have. But what is clear is that it can never work out that the benefits of being TBTF, too big to fail, are identically matched by the detriments of the regulation. They, they will never come out even. It will be one way or the other. And the chances of that happening, that they will come out even, are just vanishingly <coughs> small. So one way or another, we will have made a huge mistake if we allow the largest firms in the non-bank financial industry, especially the capital markets, to be designated as SIFIs and thus regulated like banks. Thanks.
Thank you, Peter. I'm now going to go to our next uh, panelist. Uh, Commissioner Gallagher was confirmed by the Senate on October 21st, 2011. He first joined the staff uh, of, of uh, the SEC in January 2006, serving as counsel, counsel to SEC Commissioner Paul Atkins, who is also an AEI scholar, um, and later as a counsel to SEC Chairman Christopher Cox. He also served as an acting director of the Trading and Markets Division from April 2009 to January 2010, where he left to become a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Wilmer Hale. Um, and I don't know if you're going to speak from there or here, but either way, it's fine as long as our camera picks it up. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'm taking notes. I don't have formal remarks. I'm trying to gather it all together. So, so far, I think what I have is that the BFF of FSOC and FSB is TBTF. <laughs> I think that about encapsulates it. I don't know what else I need to say. It's probably a good time to give my standard disclaimer that my remarks are my own and don't necessarily reflect those of the commission. That usually quickly becomes very apparent. Um, this is a fascinating discussion. The best part about it for me is that it's actually happening. Uh, for a long time, uh, I felt like a voice in the woods of the capital markets uh, regulator crew talking about these issues, uh, FSOC, FSB, and bank-like regulation moving into the capital markets sector to the detriment of the American economy, to investors, and to taxpayers. And so I, I applaud uh, Peter Wallison for putting this together. I applaud you, Chairman Garrett, uh, for all of your work uh, in this space, the hearings, the letters, the attention paid. You've been a real stalwart on this, and uh, we really appreciate the high cover. One, one last little thing, too. I'll mention to you, Chairman Garrett, it's a lot nicer facing this way in one of these rooms. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not quite as easy facing the other way and talking to folks like you. Um, Anyway, look, this is, it's important because it's an existential issue for me. This isn't a turf battle amongst regulators. Uh, it's an existential issue for the SEC as an agency, as a capital markets regulator, but also for the capital markets. The capital markets are critically important. Look at uh, Peter's statistics, right? The, the amount of financing for the American economy that comes through the capital markets is critical. And so it's no wonder to me, based on what you've heard from uh, Peter and Chairman Garrett, that folks like to fly off to Basel and cook up ideas to restrict the American capital markets. I wonder why the Europeans would want to in induce frictions into the American capital markets. Well, maybe it's because the numbers are exactly the opposite for them. Whereas 80% of financing happens in the US capital markets in America, 80% happens in banks in Europe. And the representation at FSB is of European countries, not the EU as a whole, and so they have an outsized uh, voting presence there. That's another issue that's been touched on already, which is voting presence, the current construct of FSOC, the current construct of, of FSB. These institutions are dominated by bank regulators, and I know a lot of bank regulators, I have a lot of friends who are bank regulators. It's not personal against bank regulators, but they have a certain view of the world that's already been alluded to, and a certain view of supervision, more importantly, which involves de-risking. Everything should be de-risked. That's the toolkit of the bank regulator. That's the toolkit of Title I of Dodd-Frank. After a systemic designation is made, you roll out the, the Fed model, the Fed toolkit, which involves de-risking. Peter's going to uh, talk, or Paul, sorry, is going to talk more about that and I think give you some real data and analysis about the impact of the de-risking model on the capital markets. But it's hugely, hugely important to the point where I quite frankly don't understand whether or not there's a divide, a Chinese wall of sorts, at the Fed between the micro and macro aspects of what they do. There will be a macro impact on the micro supervisory uh, rollout of restrictions under Dodd-Frank that's been happening at the Fed. Take uh, the rulemaking under 165, uh, the, the FBO rulemaking, intermediate holding company rulemaking. We've already seen firms sending assets back to Europe. Uh, that was done in a rulemaking process, uh, obviously <coughs> under Title I of the bank, by the bank regulators. That very unlike an SEC <coughs> process didn't include a robust economic analysis uh, that wasn't going to be subject to challenge, but has already had an impact on the U.S. economy. And these things are happening slice by slice. And in the aggregate, I worry 
they will have a, a major impact on our economy. I further worry that no one is charged with looking at these things in the aggregate. If not for think tanks like AEI and academics and others and Congress, uh, there is no uh, evaluation of the aggregate impact of all of these initiatives, and it, and it worries me greatly. So, and one of the things that occurs to me in my current position is, how has this happened so unabated? The rollout of the bank-like regulation, the de-risking model. Obviously, Dodd-Frank has empowered it by statute, and Dodd-Frank gave these authorities to the bank regulators in large part, as Peter has written extensively about, because of false narratives of the financial crisis. Right? One of the main narratives of the financial crisis is regulatory failure, that and Wall Street greed. I think we both, or all of us, uh, Peter and I would agree that uh, these things featured in the financial crisis, no one's gonna argue there wasn't any Wall Street greed, or regulatory failures. Uh, one might believe that failed federal housing policy was the main reason for the financial crisis, but we won't get off on that tangent today. But the problem is that Dodd-Frank was written based on those narratives. And when it comes to regulatory failures, the capital markets regulators took the biggest hit because we don't have access to the Treasury and we don't have a balance sheet of our own. So we couldn't bail our way out of the problems we got ourselves into. And thus you had the failure of Bear Stearns if you're the SEC, uh, the failure of Lehman Brothers, the Reserve Fund breaking the buck. And you have a narrative built around the Commission's oversight program that was then baked into a statute probably not worth uh, you know, taking up time. I'd rather get to Q&A about defending these narratives, but it goes without saying that they're baked in to the statute, and therefore, you have in FSOC a body that is dominated by bank regulators and decisions being made by bank regulators. As Peter has pointed out in one of his op-eds, Roy Woodall, who's here, is the only one with expertise in insurance on the FSOC and the only dissent, funny enough, in the Prudential decision, which I find really amazing. Uh, you know, Peter points out, everyone else who didn't know anything about insurance thought it was great. So that's a real problem for us and something that we shouldn't let run amok any further than it has. But because of these false narratives, because of the construct of FSOC, the SEC, the primary regulator of the capital markets in the United States, hasn't defended itself, hasn't defended the narrative of the crisis, and quite frankly hasn't defended the markets, not that it's incumbent necessarily on the SEC to defend markets or market participants, but we do have a statutory mission to facilitate capital formation, whatever that may be. It happens apparently only when Congress tells us in a Jobs Act to, to facilitate cap capital formation, so it's hard for us to figure out on our own. But you would think that with that mission at least, or quite frankly, to protect investors, another part of our mission, we would be defending the narratives of the capital markets setting the record straight and getting the good policy. We haven't done that. And it's very unfortunate. For years now, the agency, because of the narratives of the financial crisis, certainly because of what happened with Bernie Madoff, which confirmed for everybody that the agency was inept, uh, we've been on our back. And we have not been making the proper arguments in this regulatory debate about the proper role of the government in the capital markets. And therefore, there's been uh, an unprecedented rollout of bank regulation, whether it be the pressure put on money market funds, uh, as Peter alluded to, the, the idea that capital for a money market fund makes any sense is just absolutely insane. Now, fortunately, we beat that argument back, but it's rearing its ugly head again with the OFR study uh, and the FSOC uh, potential uh, designation of asset managers, which would, of course, come with, per the Collins Amendment, uh, bank-like capital for asset managers. It's simply doesn't make any sense. And it's driven, A, by false narratives, but also it's driven by confusion about what the lender of last resort function is uh, at the Federal Reserve. Are they gonna use it? Are they not? Are they gonna use it for non-banks? Uh, if they're not gonna use it, how much capital would you need at a capital markets entity, like an asset manager, to keep them alive? It's a really intense analysis and discussion. It just simply isn't happening in the public, it's happening behind uh, closed doors at the FSOC. So it's about time that the SEC engage, it's about time that the CFTC engage, uh, join Roy, Roy Woodall in his debate uh, over at FSOC, and with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
next on the panel is AEI scholar Paul Kupiak. He's a resident scholar uh, at AEI where he studies syst systemic risk in the management and regulation of banks and financial markets. He follows developments in financial regulation with an interest in assessing the impact of financial regulations on the U.S. economy. He has a long uh, biography, a long resume, but before joining AEI, he was an associate director of the Division of Insurance and Research within the Center for Financial Research at the FDIC. Uh, he was also director of the Center for Financial Research at the FDIC and chairman of the Research Task Force of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Um, worked at the IMF, uh, also Freddie Mac, J.P. Morgan, and um, at a couple of other places. So without further ado, Paul. Hey, Sean. Um, thanks for inviting me to the panel today. And I like to start off when talks on systemic risk by, by letting you know that um, I'm one of the few people in the world that have, that have worked at three CIFIs, three of the biggest CIFIs in the world. I worked at the Federal Reserve Board, which is probably the biggest CIFI, right? I worked at J.P. Morgan, which now J.P. Morgan Chase and, and, and Freddie Mac, back when it was a solvent institution back in the 90s. So, I, so systemic risk and shadow banking and, and maybe Freddie Mac's a shadow bank. But I, I, Peter asked me to talk a little bit about trying to make these ideas of what is shadow banking, what is maturity transformation, what are the costs of systemic risk and, 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 the, and, and, and what is the economy sort of trade off if you, if you regulate uh, shadow banking like banking. And I, I want to try to make those, um, those ideas a little more concrete to you and, and I'm going to do it without mathematics. And um, m most of the people uh, that ever go to economics talks on systemic risk or other things, you know, there's equations and everything flying. I'm going to try to be really concrete and, and, and help you understand some of the issues. So Peter first pointed to um, what, what is a shadow bank and the Financial Stability Port Board put up, you know, uh, had that great big long definition which Peter mentioned is, is incredibly broad and, and really could apply to anything. So l let me give you a concrete example from, from my past when I worked at the IMF. I, I spent some time in Iceland and you might remember Iceland blew up a few years ago. And, and I was there you know, before it blew up and while it was blowing up. But there, I can give you a good example there. So in Iceland, it's a small island, 350,000 people. There was a few banks, uh, a few big companies. They, they do aluminum uh, smelting. They, they make power. And, and they make something called Arctic trucks. And if you see my handout, I gave you a pretty picture of an Arctic truck. They, take, they buy these four-wheel drive trucks, and they turn them into these monster trucks, and then Vikings go out and cruise the glaciers and run around volcanoes and these things, and it's a profitable business. And so let's think about this Arctic truck concrete example, and let's, let's say for sake of argument, I don't really know how they raise their money, I'm going to make this up, but let's say they borrow using commercial paper, and, and what do they do? They, they buy trucks and they, and they put parts on them and build an inventory, and the trucks last for many years. So there's a couple of, couple of buzzwords in that first part. First of all, there's leverage, they borrow. Um, the commercial paper, that's shadow banking. Um, commercial paper's short-term debt. Uh, the trucks last a long time, that's maturity transformation. So I got, all those, I got all those buzzwords in there. Now, let's say the Iceland economy unexpectedly freezes, that's a joke, okay? The customers in Iceland stop, stop buying trucks and, and everything else in Iceland, by the way, when the fish harvest is bad or or, or it doesn't snow enough or something, you know, it, it affects the whole island. And so let's say Arctic Trucks can't roll over its commercial paper, right, and it defaults. But, it, you know, investors aren't buying any commercial paper of any firms anymore in Iceland because the recovery is tanking and, and they see this. And, and so the, the Arctic Trucks default is sort of happening at the same time people are re realizing the economy's heading into a recession. And what do the Icelandic firms that issue commercial paper do? Well, they go and they draw on their bank lines of credit, right? And so the, the, the default in the commercial paper market is viewed as you know, causing all the firms to have to rush in and draw on commercial paper lines at banks. And these banks, by the way, are under pressure now because there's a recession coming and investors don't want to buy the bank's paper because you know, they know the banks are going to be exposed. So I think we've got leverage in here, we've got maturity transformation, we've got the banking system being negatively affected by feedback. And, and this is, I think, a bank regulator's idea of, of sort of shadow banking causing systemic risk in the banking sector. But, but what I want to do is I want to take this apart a little more and let's look at the different pieces and, and see. So if a regulator wanted to fix this, how would they fix it? Well, presumably they would, they would, they would say, well, 
Arctic Trucks and other firms can't use the CP markets as much. So wh what are they going to do then? Well, if, they, if the Arctic Trucks can't use commercial paper to borrow, that's going to push borrowing back into the banking system. Right? So if the costs of, 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 of raising money go up, well, they're going to invest less, the, the Arctic Trucks and every, everybody else in Iceland. But forcing all this credit back into the banking system leaves the banking system more exposed to, to, to the risks of the economy. So the, the risks are put back in the banking system if we, if we push on the shadow banking system. Now, now how, do you, how do you solve that? What's the real risk in the, con in the economy? The real risk is the economy of recession, right? That, that firms are going to be going along, building inventory, waiting for good times, and all of a sudden demand stops and they've got all this inventory they can't sell. So the, that's, the real, that's the real problem. And the only way pushing it into the banking system is going to fix the real problem is if it's somehow the bank bankers or the bank regulators push down on the borrowing ability of Arctic trucks and everybody else before they build the inventory. So they have to have you know the crystal ball or the you know high power binoculars and see the recession coming before the financial markets do and, and shut down borrowing. Otherwise, you got the inventory, you got no demand, you got you got the, the bad credits in the banks, right? And all of them now and not in the shadow banks. So I mean, so do banks really discipline markets in a more timely way than, than do than, than do the securities markets? Are they really better at disciplining markets? Well, really, banking system, you know, are set up so that we keep deposits from running. We, we, we try to keep the funding as much as we can of the banking system, system stable so they can keep funding firms longer. So, so in the face of it, we're, we set up bank regulations so that money doesn't run out of the banking system. So I think there's a real incentive that the bankers are actually going to fund these kind of firms longer longer into the recession and not, not shut them off as quickly as financial markets. So that's just going to make the credit loss kind of worse. Um, it's also possible, and there's some stories that, that, that you could tell in banking, that bankers have long-term relationships with firms and, and markets might shut them off more quickly and these firms really, they could have been nursed through the, through the recession and, and you shouldn't have cut them off, so bankers might be helpful in that regard. But, but the, the whole point here is it's really not clear that putting the bankers in charge of regulating how much borrowing is going on unless they have some better crystal ball than anybody else is, is really going to is really going to fix the losses right the losses come from somewhere real in the economy so bank regulators i think we've already pointed out their solution putting it out of taking it out of the shadow banking system squashing it down and putting it into the banks is going to is going to increase firm costs market you know financial firms go to the cheapest way, place to to borrow money and 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 so, and bank regulators would argue, well, that's true, but one of the reasons it's so cheap in the financial markets, cheaper than in the banking system, is you don't have enough regulations. We in the banking system, we regulate it, we take in all those externalities, you have let, let, let firms have too much credit, They're, it's unregulated, and, and all of a sudden there's fire sales and all these negative liquidity spirals and all that kind of stuff, and we, we in the banking system, you know, we regulators, we keep that under control, so we prevent that, whereas shadow banks, they really allow that to happen. Um, you know that I'm, I'm being, I got my regulator hat on now. So the the problem with this argument essentially is that bank regulators are arguing they they are able to control excess credit and excess liquidity, but you know calling the problem excess credit and excess liquidity somehow somehow leaves this impression that that you can you can separate necessary and appropriate credit from unnecessary and excess credit and liquidity and. And, and really, that's not true at all. And, and I'll give you an example, and an example that deals with bank regulators and the Financial Stability Board. So back in the early 2000s, back before the crisis, you might remember uh, securitization was going on all over the place. Banks were taking mortgage mortgages, wrapping them up into securities, selling them mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, all kinds of things. And the bankers were concerned about this, and, and in the what was called the... Um, before, the financial stability was originally called the Committee on Global Financial System, C Committee on the Global Financial System, and then it became the Financial Stability Institute, and finally the Financial Stability Board. It's all the same thing. It just changed its name over time. And back in the early 2000s, really the central bankers got together and they studied securitization, and they put out a report, a, a big glossy report on the BIS website, the Center for All International Banking Knowledge, and they concluded that, that these transactions, these credit risk transfer products, securitization, credit default swaps, they reduced risk in the banking system by transferring credit risk to the investors that best understood it and can manage it. So they looked real hard at everything that was going on in the crisis, and they put out, actually they updated that report three times before 2006, 
right? They, three times they updated it. Every time they looked at it, they said, yep, this is really good. It's really good for risk management. And what happened? Was, well, it wasn't really good for risk management. It really wasn't being used for risk management. It blew up. So trusting the bank regulators to identify excess credit and liquidity might not be your best avenue. But anyway, let me talk a little bit about systemic risk. And I'm, I'm going to run short of time. But how, how, does, how does the shadow banking shadow banking create maturity transformation and systemic risk, and how does that relate to how a banking system might do it? And there's a literature in, in monetary economics, and it, it, which you don't, I don't want to send you out and read, but it's a literature that talks about how an economy creates inside money and the difference between inside money and outside money. But I'm going to give you a little storybook economy story that I think I can hopefully get through in five minutes and will give you some sense of what maturity transformation does, why it's important, why it's valuable, and how systemic risk can arise, and then how reducing systemic risk is the cost it's going to cause for the economy. So, so let me start with my, my little storybook economy, and this is really, uh, it's, it's, it's related to some papers in the literature, so I'm kind of borrowing ideas, but let's say we have, we have three types of people. There's a type one person, a type two person, and a type three person. And and each of these people uh, has a dollar, in, in a dollar Federal Reserve note in their wallet, and they inherit an apple tree. And the apple trees are all the same. They're good apple trees. They make apples. The only problem is the apple trees ripen at different times. So, so maybe they all live in a little town, and, and one apple tree is in the valley, and one's halfway up the mountain, and one's at the top of the mountain. So one of the apple trees ripens you know, at week one, one after second week, and one in week three. So they ripen. T it's different times apart, and, but the problem is the people that own the three apple trees don't want to consume apples when they're ripening. So the type one agent really wants to eat his apples right away, but unfortunately his apple tree's at the top of the mountain, so it doesn't ripen for three weeks. The, the type two agent, he wants to consume apples at ty type two, uh, but, but his, his apples actually ripen immediately, so he, he would have to eat them all now. He really doesn't want to eat them now. He wants to wait a week and eat them. And the, 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 the type one individual wants to eat his apples immediately. I already said that. Okay, so the type three wants to eat his apples at type, at time two, but his, his apples, I forget, the other, the other week they do it. But anyway, we're gonna, get, we're gonna get to financial contracts in one second. So the, if these three people live in a village and they all know each other, they live there forever and they trust each other, they don't need financial markets to fix this. They just all agree I'm going to harvest my apples, and we're going, to, we're going to swap them, right? I'm going to give you my apples. When you want your apples, you give me yours. And, and, and there's trust. You don't need money. You don't need a contract. But let's say, let's say that two people are new in the village, right? So two, two people move in the, in the village, and you don't know who they are. And, and the, last, the, the one person in the village has got the apple tree at the top of the mountain, and he's lived there forever. And he's a Boy Scout, and he puts out the water for the dog, feeds the birds. He's just a good citizen. Everybody trusts him. Well, if everybody trusts him and he'll honor his contract, he could actually maybe issue a long-term bond. He could say, okay, I'm willing to trade my apples in date three with apples at date one, and whoever has this piece of paper, I'm going to give my apples to date three if they show me this piece of paper. So it's a bearer bond for apples at day three. And if he's trustworthy enough, and the other two people are unknown, and they have no credibility, and they can't issue securities, then but this could still work. So the, the, the person that wants app, so the, so the type one person issues this bond and, and, and the type two agent who has apples that, that, that ripen immediately buys the bond with his apples and he holds the bond for a period, but he doesn't want to eat those apples because he wants day two apples. But when he holds the bond into day two and then because this contract is completely trustworthy because this guy's the boy scout and everybody's known him forever, the type three person is willing to buy the bond for the, the app, who, the type three person has apples that are ripening at day two, he's willing to, get, to give the day two apples for this piece of paper. And at the end of type three, this piece of paper, this long-term bond is presented to type one and, and, and the apples are delivered. So everybody's happy. You created one contract, one long-term piece of paper, there's no bank involved, that's shadow banking, right? There's a long-term contract where agents use it in between and trade it. They don't buy the bond because they want what the bond, the final payment of the bond. They buy the bond as a means for transferring resources across states because they don't have the credibility themselves 
to issue a contract. Nobody knows who I am. They're not going to buy my paper, but, but that one person who has credibility issues long-term paper. Everybody else can trade that paper in a spot market. That's a shadow bank. You don't need a bank. Now, if you wanted a bank in that economy, everybody could take the dollar, fiat dollar, and set up a bank. They could put it in the bank, and, and the type one person who has the apples at the top of the mountain could take out a long-term bank loan and take all the fiat money and then use the fiat money to buy apples from day two, and you could use the fiat money through, and the, the long-term bank loan could, could be in place of the long-term bond. Now, where does systemic risk come, come in? Well, let's say it, you get to day two, and there's this long-term bond outstanding or a bank loan, and there's this big announcement that there's an apple blight, that and it's not going to hit for a year, but in day three, we expect the apple harvest to be horrible, right? So this guy's got this, issued this long-term bond, and you're going to get all the apples in day three. The, day, the time two guy owns that bond, but nobody wants to buy that bond from him anymore because it's not going to deliver any apples in day three because there's a blight. Well, what happens is the markets lock up. That bond can no longer be used for intermediation across time, and, and, and the economy breaks down. The same thing happens in banking. At time two, the bank loan is bad. Everybody that has the deposits in the bank knows that that bank loan is no good anymore. The bank doesn't have the capital to honor the deposit, so they run the bank. But you're left with type two and type three basically having to sort out between them. The, the nice, smooth allocation of resources where everybody gets the apples in the right date no longer works. But the systemic risk affects the banking system, and it affects the shadow banking system in exactly the same way in these economies. There's no difference. There's no difference. But so how could you fix that? How could you fix the systemic risk if you wanted to fix it? It wouldn't matter if it was a bank or a shadow bank. Well, what you would have to do is you'd have to have a regulation that says that the long-term debt that's issued can only be so many apples. You'd have to guess that what's the worst possible apple blight you could have? Oh, it could only give 25% of, of a normal apple harvest. So you would have to restrict the long-dated instrument traded in this economy, whether it be a bank loan or it be a bond, you'd have to restrict it to 25% of the apple harvest. Well, if you did that, the paper would never be bad because you, the investors would know, well, it's never going to get bad enough to, 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 to be below that. But the problem, the cost is, people can only trade 25% of their apples now. Eat, they have to eat 75% of their apples when they ripen on their own tree, and that makes them really unhappy because they don't want to eat them at that date. So the cost of reducing systemic risk is you have to lower everybody's utility forever to prevent the, the, the cost that might happen in a rare occasion when somebody announces, oh, there could be a blight in a year, right? It's a, it's a low probability event. But to, to push it down, you have to lower everybody's welfare. So the cost of preventing systemic risk, an event that happens very rarely, is really limiting the ability to intermediate across time. That's expensive. There's no production in my economy. It's just a trade economy. But I could put production in it, and it would have a lot more math than other stuff. But that's basically the idea of a shadow bank versus a bank and how you would control systemic risk and why it would be costly for the economy. Um, I think we're getting out of time, so I think I'll wrap it up there because I think we want to take some questions, right? Sorry if I ran over. Thank you, Paul. I'm regretting not having purchased apples for our, uh, lunch today. Um, questions, uh, and we will go a little bit over, so I understand if people need to uh, sneak out a little bit. Um, if I can ask our panelists, we do not have a microphone for the people asking the questions. This is uh, being taped, so if you could either repeat the question when you ask, when you answer it, or incorporate the question into your answer, uh, that would be very helpful for those who are going to watch it. Dan Crowder, Tan, Dave, sir, Paul, Mr. Commissioner Gallagher, I couldn't agree more that the SEC needs to reassert its jurisdictional prerogatives with respect to the capital market. This is why I commend Chair White for putting the OFR asset manager study out for public comment so we can get some transparency and strengthen some due process. But that begs the question in my mind about uh, due process as it applies to EFSA. When they uh, started uh, issuing regulations, SIPI designation, apparently somebody at Treasury read Dodd Frank and realized that they don't have any rulemaking authority, so now they recharacterize them as guidelines. I want to get your thoughts on the lack of rulemaking authority in FSOC and whether that might lead to uh, legal challenges to those designations. Uh, well, not being an FSOC member, 
uh, I don't know the intricacies, unfortunately, of uh, FSOC procedures. Unlike Chairman Garrett and Commissioner Pivovar, I like to sit on the outside and throw my rocks in. Um, but uh, maybe someday I'll walk down the street with them and try to break down the doors and get into an FSOC meeting. Um, I, I don't know the intricacies in the analysis that's been given to the FSOC members, but I think it should trouble everybody. Uh, that there's just the general lack of transparency, whether it be through a public notice and comment APA compliant rulemaking process, whether it be uh, you know further transparency regarding discussions at the meetings. Uh, if you look at the GAO report from last year of the lack in the lack of transparency at FSOC, that should trouble everybody. Um, I'll tell you as a uh, member, presidential appointee, congressional, uh, Senate confirmed. Uh, member of the SEC, you know, I have no transparency into the FSOC that our chairman doesn't want to give to me. And it's gotten better, but it's still far from great. And there's not a lot of iterative involvement, substantive involvement. It's more reporting back from these meetings. So the whole of FSOC with respect to transparency uh, is a major problem. And I hope it's something they can take up. Apparently, I saw on some agenda somewhere that tomorrow they're going to talk about transparency at the deputies' meetings. I have no idea what that means. Um, you know, as to legal challenge, my fear, because FSOC uh, is, is very much like a bank regulator in the sense that does the Fed ever get sued for their rulemakings? No, because they're dealing with a captive audience. Does the SEC ever get sued on its rulemakings that cover securities exchanges? No. They'd be crazy because we're in their business every day. They send their rule filings into us every day. When do we get sued? We get sued when you have a large pool of affected parties, right? When there's some outlier who can't be controlled uh, by the government, wants to vindicate their rights, a trade group, uh, you know, that decides to put their head above the firing line. And unfortunately, that doesn't apply to me in the bank rulemaking sphere and therefore into the FSOC sphere. So I don't think they view it as a threat, and because of that, they can push ahead with initiatives, guidelines, rules, whatever. They know they're not getting sued, they think they're not getting sued, and it's very much the same attitude that gave us the Volcker Rule being promulgated under the Bank Holding Company Act, uh, even at independent agencies not, that don't have authority uh, generally to enforce the Bank Holding Company Act without a cost-benefit analysis. Let me just add to that that uh, Prudential, after it was uh, designated, seriously considered an appeal. First the administrative appeal and then going to court. And I think uh, I've talked to some of the people who advise them and who are talking also to MetLife. And the, the, the thought is, well, I mean, do you really want to sue your regulator? Um, you don't see, uh, I've practiced banking law for many years and represented bank holding companies. And uh, I would say to my clients, you know, you, can, you, you have rights here. Um, go ahead. I mean, look, look what it says. And look, here's the, here's the sort of things that the regulation, regulators, regulations permit you to do. And they said, oh, yeah, but uh, these are our regulators. And uh, we're afraid of retaliation. So it's not done. That's why, that's one of the reasons why the FSOC is so um, troublesome. Because we don't have the usual recourse that people might have when they're dealing with a non, with, their, with, with someone that is not their regulator. So the things that the FSOC does may remain on our books forever because no one wants to take them on legally. You know, Federal Reserve prints its own money, gives 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 their ass back to, but it doesn't want to spend back. The uh, FDIC is 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 self funded. OCC, um, I, I mean, most of the banking agencies, which which would be the biggest pushers for bank regulation of everything, are self funded. But the SEC sort of is too, except that they still have to get. 
Right. And this was a question that Chair, um, former Chair Frank raised when we were it, it, discussing the issue of the CFPB and whether they were, um, how, the, how they were funded, and he sort of tossed it back to us. As you may recall, we had an amendment at that time saying the CFPB should be um, um, on budget. And he said, well, if you're going to do that, then maybe you should have all these other so-called independent regulators on budget as well. And I think our response at that time, well, we haven't had enough hearings on it. Um, but now after this, we may need to have enough hearings uh, on all the rest to begin the uh, take a more serious look on how they're all funded. Well, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's even kind of worse than that, right? So, yes, um, in, in banking, international banking regulation, the U.S. banks at least have a voice through their regulators. Uh, in the IAIS, which is the International Insurance Regulation Association, since the U.S. doesn't have a national insurance regulator, who is the voice for the insurance companies in America in that forum? Is there one? Three. three. So but the states? Okay. Okay. So the Federal Reserve Board is going to the insurance. Oh, wow. Um, oh, go ahead, please. Oh, I, I was just going to mention that the IAIS, this is another aspect of the FSB, the IAIS was directed by the FSB to come up with a methodology for judging what a GSI is, and that is a, a, a globally systemic insurance institution, okay, GSI. They were directed to come up with a me methodology, which they did. Um, it's a very interesting methodology, actually. That was published, but there's absolutely no indication that when the FSB designated insurance companies, these nine insurance companies, as G-size, that they used the metho methodology that the IAIS came up with. So if we think the FSOC is not transparent, um, the FSB is just as non-transparent and in, in many ways worse. Let me mention one other thing, and that is that I talked in my little talk about the fact that all this came down from the G20, and this is very important because um, they, these are the political masters, if you will, and when these 
uh, regulators and, in, and um, uh, central bankers think about um, what they have to do. They're sitting in meetings and they are told, well, the G20 directed us to do this. What are they going to say? I mean, I don't agree with the G20. I mean, they can't do that because, in fact, they are subordinate to the G20. The G20 are their bosses. So um, it, becomes, it becomes a much different process. And I've talked to people who've been on these. In, when they were at the SEC, for example, they were sitting on some of these panels. And they said, well, we don't necessarily agree with this. And the answer was, well, this is what we, the rest of us agree with. And we're following the directions of the FSB, which is following the directions of the G20. So what do you want to do? And the answer is, well, I can't do much, and it gets through. So it's a, it is a very dangerous process, and one that is going to creep gradually into the United States if we don't, we're not careful. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, quickly. So just very quickly, so I, I appreciate your opinion here later on as far as our legislation that's uh, we'll hope to have looked at maybe in a hearing after we come back, which requires some sort of um, transparency by the uh, FSOC with regard to when they're involved with uh, international uh, agreements. Maybe that. I mean, that's the first step um, that allows stakeholders to have, uh, at least to be put on notice and have some input given. Or maybe you have some other ideas that, you know, what's, what's the other steps after that? I mean, I guess the first one off the top of your head is to say they cannot enter into enter agreements. They cannot be part of any association where there are not equivalent um, sunshine statutes and availability of input, so on and so forth, like we have here in the United States. And so that would basically preclude them from being part of these agencies until they, uh, are akin to what we do here. Now that, of course, all requires legislation. Um, but the uh, the one sunny note, I guess, is the fact that even without the legislation, as Dan talked about and I talked about, you know, they're already at EPSOC doing something. We don't know what, just from the fact that we're you guys are, and uh, others are having a, a focus on this. So who knows what we can do even without getting the legislation all the way through the process, at least to be uh, opening until better times. I just want to. I'll leave this one on the table because I didn't get to rail on G20. Um, you know, this is a really important part, and this is me uh, wandering into matters of uh, the State Department that maybe I don't fully understand. But to Peter's point about these G20 commitments, go back to Pittsburgh and think about what they said on derivatives, and now we have this one world derivatives push. This is really a top down, one world view of regulation. Derivatives is easy. Uh, the, you know, the, the on-the-ground oversight and supervision of broker-dealers and asset managers, insurance companies, that's something wholly separate. Uh, but it really, what it amounts to, to me, is treaty-level binding commitments without the treaty, which means without Congress, right? And therefore, when I was in Europe in December, the big raging debate was whether TTIP should involve financial services regulation and, and much to the chagrin of every Treasury attache that was sitting with me in my many meetings throughout Europe, I said, absolutely, why not? At least we get Congress involved in that point. Instead of having people point me back to a statement uh, from the G20 in Pittsburgh every time I have to, as a substantive regulator of 5% of the derivatives markets, thank you, Title VII, uh, uh, when I have to approve a rule, I've got to be uh, brought back to that magic moment in Pittsburgh. It's a very disturbing trend. And it's not just these grandiose statements at Pittsburgh, it's the implementing arm. As was pointed out, FSB is bricks and mortar in Basel. When it was FSF, it wasn't. It was a group of people. It's kind of like PWG. It was a group of people doing their best, trying to get it together. Now it's FSOC, right? It's bricks and mortar. They have resource and detailees. It's dominated by the central bankers. And they are coming up with, as you point out, which is a great point, not just designations, but substantive regulation whether it be for insurance companies, whether it be for broker-dealer capital. And then the expectation is this will be rolled down because of the G20 commitment that gave rise to the FSB in the first place. And if you're a primary regulator like me, it's quite a surprise to learn that, again, that magic in Pittsburgh got me uh, amendments to the broker-dealer capital rules that I don't even get to vote on. So this is a disturbing trend, one which every citizen, I think, should be concerned about. That is at odds with U.S. law. But 
I, That's our last question, by the way. So we're gonna I mean, your answers here, and then we'll end the so official part. I was part. I was a part of the Basel process. Don't don't throw stones. Um, but it, I always wondered this too, and I was always very upset that you could negotiate agreements that uh, that seemed like treaties and impose them back. The way they get around it is the international agreement is is not literally binding. They have to come back and. They're supposed to promulgate laws or try to promulgate laws domestically that, that are consistent with the agreement. So they, they get around calling it a treaty or ha they claim it's not really binding, but they all agree to try to go back and do this. So I think it really is a treaty or it's very much like a treaty. Then they kind of skate around the, the edge of, edge of what, what's, what sensible people would, would argue probably ought to go you know, in front of the Congress and, and have to be approved. But they've avoided it, and 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 they get away away with it. So with that, that's the uh, end of our official part of this event. Please thank our panelists and our keynote, and uh, thank you.